Previously on the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. Join us now as Greasy Sheen and Professor Watchlist once again take a whistle-stop tour of the past episodes of the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. Josh, we're going to need hats for this. Enclose that cranium. Okay. It's 2015 and the Sheenster is aghast. President Evil, what a name for an episode. What was the actual content? No idea, me boy. Sometimes a good moniker is all you need in this business. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a year to 2016 and the good professor is studying his tea leaves. The death of Antonin Scalia. Oh. It's a good thing Josh and Em aren't currently discussing President Trump, or they'd be talking about the potential stacking of the Supreme Court. That's true. And they're off again to 2017. Greasy is eyeing up his food. You know, I don't like Malaysian food, especially given the fact that Kim Jong-un just got poisoned. Don't be silly, Greasy. Kim was poisoned with a syringe very much like this one. And finally, the distant past of 2018. An episode on history, Professor. I know, Greasy. It suddenly got very suspiciously coincidental. And you know what we say? There, there are no, no coincidences, coincidences on the podcaster's guide, guide to, to the, the conspiracy. conspiracy. Uh, except when there are. Roll theme. Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Addison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. My name is Josh Addison, sitting next to me is Dr. M. Dentith, but um, who are we and what is the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy? The Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, Joshua, is a podcast about conspiracies and conspiracy theories. I wrote a PhD on conspiracy theories in philosophy called In Defense of Conspiracy Theories, where I put forward that we have to judge individual conspiracy theories on their evidential merit, and that is what this podcast is all about, talking about conspiracies, conspiracy theories, when we ought to believe them, and when we're allowed to laugh about them. Yes. Little recap there, we thought we've been going for five years now. It's, it's possible, like you, you can't say that it's impossible, but we might actually have gained listeners. It's true, it and is Some of them might not possible. have been listening for a while. I mean, we, we, are, on, we are, are on Spotify We're on now. Spotify and everything, just like the We big. had seven streams on Spotify Did we? last week, I know. You can tell that? Yes, the podcaster's webpage for Spotify tells you yeah. about the streaming. Sure I've, we've also got a that. Google Analytics page now, and I have no idea what any of the numbers mean. Well, that was the thing. We uh, The podcast is hosted on podbean.com, which gives you mountains of analytics, and we know th th there's numbers. They go up and down. I have no Sometimes idea what any big. of them mean. I mean we, all right, For so, a while, where was it? Right, two weeks ago, we had one day where 8,000 people accessed the podcast, or at least... But what does that mean? We're never well, quite sure. Because we didn't get 8,000 listeners to any of the recent episodes. So I'm assuming someone scraped the podcast mm. for their index, and that's what occurred. Long-time listeners might remember that um, some time ago we were getting... Thousands of hits every week from one particular state in the US. I can't remember which one. I think it was Virginia. Virginia, something like that. And and, they, and so our stats were, were enormous for quite a while and then dropped off. And we don't know what it means, is it? With a, with a yeah, some, some Google or someone has happened to have a server, server farm there and their bot was scraping us. No, see, basically I think what bots, happened is that an AI became self-aware based upon our podcast uh, and then failed to take over the world because of our podcast. We were both the beginning and the end <laughs> of the singularity. So the fact Sounds that we not right. be controlled yeah. by robot overlords is entirely either our fault or our gift to you. You're welcome. Uh, now, another little another little side on your in your work as a conspiracy theory theorist at large. Um, who's Kevin Barrett, and why is it a good slash bad thing that he likes you? So, Kevin Barrett, who writes for things like Veteran Affairs, Veteran Today, which is one of those quite, quite conspiratorial websites of the type that we tend to go, hmm, mm. as opposed to yay. Uh, so, Kev Dr. Kevin ba Barrett has a PhD. He's an Arabist Islamologist, and 
according to his blurb. One of America's best-known critics on the war on terror, he's the host of Truth Jihad Radio, a hard-driving weekly radio show funded by listener donations at patreon.com, and also False Flag Weekly News, an audio-video show produced by Tony Hall, Alan Reese, and Kevin himself, which is funded through Fundraiser. And Kevin wrote a review of several books of conspiracy theories that have come out in the recent past. Now, wait a minute. You had a book on conspiracy theories. Yeah, but he's not reviewing that one. He's reviewing Joe Yusinski's book, Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them. And let me quote what Kevin wrote. Another relatively sensible essay is MRX Dentith's Conspiracy Theories and Philosophy, which ably deconstructs the most basic fallacy permeating the whole field of conspiracy theory research, the a priori assumption that a conspiracy theory must be false, or at least dubious. Now he's quoting me, if certain scholars, and now he interjects himself, i.e. the majority represented in this book, back to me, want to make a special case for conspiracy theories, then it is reasonable to, for the rest of us to ask whether we're playing fair with our terminology or whether we have baked into our definitions the answers to our research programs. Uh, he then goes on to say, unfortunately, a few pages later, editor Joe Yusinski sticks his fingers in his ears and plays deaf and dumb, claiming that, to quote Joe, the establishment is right far more often than conspiracy theories, largely because their methods are reliable. When conspiracy theories are right, it is by chance. He adds that conspiracy theories will inevitably occasionally lead to disaster, whatever that means. Mm. Uh, so yes, I'm assuming this person would take... Uh, exception to the idea that conspiracy theories are wrong more often than right and that the authorities are right more often than wrong. Yes, and I said I do, I do think Joe's being a little bit naive there mm. by simply going sui ge- generis, the establishment is more often right than wrong. How do we actually measure that? Uh, and the notion that they're more reliable, they're also quite good at covering up embarrassing Mm. things that would embarrass them because by definition they are embarrassing Mm -hmm. well there you go that's us that's the podcast um maybe we should stop talking about the podcast and start talking the podcast indeed because what we normally do now is we move straight in to the news Mm -hmm. breaking breaking conspiracy theories in the news That's somewhat of a lie, though, because we normally do the news after some other things in between. We're doing the news first now in a a drastic break with tradition. And we normally do something like this. A new path Mm. forward to glory, to fortune, and also it makes more sense to do the retractions and updates after the news rather than before. So there you go. Uh, But into the news, we start with a disturbing story, which just turns... Now, I'm sorry, Josh, but we have breaking news. This... This bit is scripted. Irrelevant. People may well be aware that we mentioned that guest of the show, David Icke, was about to embark on a tour of Australia, but not also Aotearoa, New Zealand. Well, it's off. Hours before Icke was due to get on a plane to the Southern Hemisphere, his visa was cancelled by the Australian government. Icke, as predicted, is apoplectic about the news, and there's even a petition to get the government to retract the retraction of the visa. Uh, so I guess reissue it. Anyway, Ike is not arriving down under, unlike Jordan Peterson, who apparently is touring the country looking for lobsters. But that's a- another matter. Back to the news. Shouldn't that have gone in the update section? It doesn't matter. matter. <clears throat> Back to the actual news. And the weird story of the week, uh, the attack or alleged attack on Jussie Smollett. Smollett, a gay African-American actor, told police on January the 29th that he had been accosted early in the morning by two men who had yelled racial and homophobic slurs before putting a rope around his neck and dousing him in bleach. Yet now reports are coming out from members of the Chicago Police Department that the attack was staged. What has followed in the last few weeks are claims and counterclaims of a conspiracy to create the appearance of an attack, with some pressuring Smollett using the event, sorry, with some presuming Smollett using the event to raise his career profile. The issue seems to stem from the fact that the two men Smollett initially identified from CCTV footage as being behind the attack were in fact known to him, one being his personal trainer. Not just that, but it's alleged that one of the suspects is said to have claimed they did a practice run of the attack days before the alleged assault. 
Predictably, beliefs about the hoax seem to fall very much along the lines of whether or not the believer thinks that there are systemic or racial and homophobic issues in America. But, well, I mean, if it's a hoax, it's also a conspiracy. That makes it news to us. Quite a sad story, actually, because if the attack occurred, that's terrible. And if it's a hoax, that's it's still also kind of terrible. terrible. But terrible in a really weird way. Mm. And this this one, I mean, yeah, the, the back and forth has been has been quite crazy. It, um, when we, in between us first writing notes for this and sitting down to record it, stuff happened, which meant we needed to revise things. Probably by in the gap between us recording this and you actually listening to it, something else would have happened that's yeah. rendered this all moot. It's all been very strange and bizarre. Yes, this is news which is mm. quite definitely timestamped to Thursday evening in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Yes. Things may happen overnight before the podcast goes up, which changed the story entirely. We will not be held to what happens to our future selves. Indeed, not this time. And from one nation to another, we glance at our neighbours across the ditch. Australian universities are relieved that their Department of Defence has failed to secure backing from an independent review of the Defence Trade Controls Act for sweeping new powers over international research collaboration. Yes, in news which shows powerful organisations can openly want even more power, which makes you wonder what they're agitating for behind closed doors, the Australian Department of Defence wanted stricter controls over the development of new technologies. These powers, which would have allowed them to carry out search and seizure operations without a warrant. This in turn would have adversely affected Australian universities and research centres who work with overseas interests to develop and share new technologies. Had the Department of Defence gained these new powers, they could have effectively stymied international collaboration under the guise of protecting Australian interests. But in an interesting twist, Australian authorities have rejected this power bid. Well, for the time being. Mm. I think Australia has a reputation for being a little more right-wing than New Zealand. Although Australia still, still is far the, the US of, of Australasia. It is, and we are pretty much the Canada of Australia. Damn. Except so, much smaller. Yes, mm. yes. It's a, it's a very weird a relationship result. we have with our cousins across the ditch. Yes, I was talking to an Australian just today about uh, government sort of surveillance type plans, and he was very much along d doing the whole, well, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear thing, to which I replied, can I have your PIN number in that case? But... Um, Yes, I don't know. So it's it's nice to see this one did get shut down, but uh, who knows where things will go from here. Well, precisely. Australia, it's a bit of a magic eight ball, as we've said in the past. Mm. Now, finally, evidence of voter fraud in the US. Yes, we now have evidence that the Republicans are right. No, hang on, hang on. We have evidence that the Republicans, who keep on going on and on about voter fraud, have themselves been fraudulently altering absentee ballots. Uh, well, we're holding on. Republican operatives in a 2018 congressional race in North Carolina have. Uh, appearing before the North Carolina State Board of Elections, several witnesses said that they were paid to collect absentee ballots by McCray Dowless, who presumably had his first names amputated in some sort of freak accident. Well, I'm not sure. Repu Repu Republican operatives are produced mm. in factory vats and <laughs> in factories and the depths of nowhere, so yes. I assume so, yes. Mm. Uh, at any rate, McRae Dallas, a political operative hired by people working for Republican candidate Mac Mark Harris. The witnesses admitted to fi filling out ballots which hadn't been fully completed, filling in any omitted choices with a vote for whoever was a Republican. They were also trained in techniques to not throw up red flags, like making sure they put stamps on the right way, signed witness signatures with the same colour ink as the rest of the ballot, and mailing absentee ballots in small numbers in order to not raise suspicions. The witnesses insisted the candidate had no knowledge of the operation, uh, and no evidence has been presented to show that Harris knew what his political operative was doing. Still, plausible deniability is precisely what you want when engaging in fraud, isn't it? And I understand, uh, just reading before I came to record this podcast, I, I believe his son testified against him, Mark Harris's son. Oh, or possibly that, that, that is, son. that's breaking no, news. Son. It basically testified that um, uh, he, he knew his father had, had, had retained the services of someone to do these dodgy things and had told his father not to do it. Um, so some people have sort of said... You know, congratulations to this young man for making the hard choice to do what's right and, instead of um, 
protecting his own family, although others have said he's he's basically saying, I'm not going to perjure myself and ruin my career just to make up for the fact that my dad did a boneheaded thing that I already warned him not to do. But um, interesting case indeed. Yes, and once again, evidence of voter fraud, but not from the direction the Republicans actually claim it's coming from. Indeed, where it's not so much voter fraud as election fraud, I think, which seems to be a thing. Voter fraud doesn't really seem to exist. Election fraud, on the other hand... Is um, rife in a gerrymandered democracy like the United States of America. God bless America. God bless them, said the atheists. <clears throat> uh, so that's it for news. Um, we generally proceed this with a, a section on updates to things we've talked about before, but this time we're choosing to... sub. What's the opposite of proceed? Subsequently sub have subsequent, a Subsequentarize yes, the update new word. Subsequentarize the updates and the retractions. Mm, that's what we're going to do now. Updates. And retractions. So, an update on the Anne-Marie Brady case, which we discussed last year. If you weren't aware, Brady is a local academic who mostly works on China and its use of soft power. Last year, her office was broken into several times and her car was seemingly sabotaged. At the time, China, well, more properly people in Beijing, were suspected as being the criminal masterminds behind the series of unfortunate events. This was largely suspected due to A, Brady's criticisms of China, B, Beijing not liking such criticisms, and C, some of her fellow academics who had also criticised Beijing, having also reported being threatened by Chinese authorities. However, the police investigation here into all of this has led to nothing. The year-long investigation involved the New Zealand Police's National Security Investigation Team, a somewhat shadowy organisation who work with the New Zealand Security and Intelligence Service and Interpol. At the moment, the crimes just remain unsolved, with no leads to track down. It's quite an interesting story, because everyone suspects China, mm. except for the authorities that do the investigations, who have gone, well, no leads. No idea what's happening. Which, of course, is leading to people thinking that maybe it's a diplomatic thing. Mm. They're not going to blame China outright, because that would be bad for diplomacy. We'll just simply give them a signal of some kind. Or maybe it's just a set of coincidences well, with no unifying cause whatsoever. Yep, never know. Yeah, I mean, the, the evidence that China's behind it seems to be more sort of circumstantial and that it, she's kind of made herself an enemy of them and then things start happening. But... Um... Yes, it's 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 not a good look, I think. It's no, one, one of those no. things where that's the best you can say. Yes, not a mm. good look. And Moving talking on. about not good looks, more news from Aotearoa, New Zealand, featuring Cameron Slater, a.k.a. Whale Oil, oh, who cool. has lost his defamation case against Matthew Blomfeld. Now, we discussed Slater in the past. He's a political blogger who was heavily involved in a dirty politics scandal surrounding the 2014 general election. Slater, along with local Adrian Edmondson impersonator Carrick Graham, were commissioned by ex-business associates of Blomveld to run a smear campaign. The conspiracy was, however, uncovered, and Blomveld sued for defamation. Slater's defence, that of truth, has been dismissed because Slater wasn't actually able to prove any of the allegations made on his blog were honest opinion. We at the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy realise this is a very minor conspiracy, but minor conspiracies are the kind of thing which help normalise conspiracies generally. Mm. Not to mention the fact that Cameron Slater has shown himself time and time again to be kind of a horrible human being, so there is, and it's, there is and, some and amount of schadenfreude. And it's on. not the only legal reckoning we're waiting for this year, because there's also the... Mm. Defamation by a bunch of nutritional scientists who Cameron Slater allegedly ran a smear campaign against. Mm. And then there's the Food Council thing where Catherine Rich and Cameron Slater allegedly ran a smear campaign. So it's bad times for Cameron yes. Slater. A bunch of chickens coming home to roost. Cock a doodle do. Mm. Well,. Yeah, I, I, I had literally no way of following that. So how about we just jump straight into the main content and talk about a certain Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Yes, let's talk about Lyndon LaRouche. I don't know why I said that with a, a strange pause. He's I a strange gonna... man. He deserves a strange pause. It's true. He mm. was a very, very strange man. Mm. 
So Josh, prior to my mentioning Lyndon LaRouche last week, actually actually earlier this week on Sunday, we when we recorded the most recent episode mm. prior to this one, you had no idea who this fellow was, did I, you? I had heard the name Lyndon LaRouche before. But no, if, if you'd asked me about him, I couldn't have told you a damn thing. So I, I, I did a little bit of reading, and uh, goodness me, he was an interesting character. Yeah, was, so obviously, he, he died uh, on the 12th of this month, about 10 days ago as we record, uh, which is why we're talking about him now. But um, in terms of conspiracy theories, he was, he was quite the figure, I understand. And I mean, what's interesting about LaRouche was that he was a major enough figure that when I was writing my PhD, which was submitted in 2012 that he got a mention in the PhD. In fact, he even gets a mention at the very beginning of my first book, published in 2014, The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories. But he really hasn't been very notable in the years since, so I don't think he's ever rated a mention no, on this podcast. I don't think so. Up until the bonus episode last week, where we mentioned to Patreons, who get advanced warning about things, we'd be talking about LaRouche this week. Yes, so I mean, from what I could gather, he was biggest sort of in the 80s, the 70s, 90s perhaps, but so it's been 10 years or more since he was particularly relevant. I mean, he did die at the age of 96. Well, exactly, yes. So he had very good innings, and you can understand the last 10 years that maybe yes, he wasn't probably as prominent wasn't in, it is, as he was in, say, his 80s or 70s. Yes. Uh, so... Lyndon Hermile LaRouche Jr. First of all, that is an outstanding name. It to is. Be, he's to be I mean, he does come from a time it. period where outstanding mm. names were da Yes. Born September the 8th, 1922. Died February 12th, 2019. Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, Linda, what, what can we say about him? Imagine... If, if Alex Jones turned out to be right all along about the chemicals in the water turning you gay, and he had a baby with Jordan Peterson and that baby went back in time and then started doing the sorts of things that they were doing before the internet even existed, that's kind of, with a little bit of, I don't know, David Koresh sort of culty. He had an armed compound, for Christ's sake. He lived in an armed compound at some stage. Yeah, he sure did. Shall we go through? Let's, yeah, let's go through just, the life. Yeah, of, life and the life of, and times of Lyndon LaRouche. Of Hermy, as we may well decide to call him, I don't given think that we will, wonderful we middle mm. name. So, Lyndon LaRouche was the son of Orthodox Quakers. Uh, he attended Columbia University in New York as a disaffected member of the Spartacus League, which was something I didn't even know existed no. up until doing this research. So, the Spartacus League is a Trotsky-esque organization uh, named after the original Spartacus League, which actually comes from a German revolutionary group in post-World War I. Did they start every meeting by standing up and saying, I'm a Spartacus, and then the next person says, no, I'm a Spartacus, and then they all do that and have a good laugh and then get on with things? I assume so, but they in they German. Have to. Yeah, oh, well, it's yes, in... obviously the original yeah. one. Mm. Uh, mein Name is Spartacus. Ich heiße Spartacus. Nein, mein Name <laughs> is Spartacus. Anyway, uh, he taught courses on Marxism at a free university in New York, and the big moment basically is in 1968. So in 1968, there are student protests all throughout New York. So all the big New York universities go into protest. LaRouche senses an opportunity, and I'm using that term quite specifically here, because as we'll see with LaRouche's fam uh, history, sensing opportunities is basically what his political career was all about. And so he forms a Labour committee during the protest to mobilise student support for sanitation workers who are striking at the same time. So he goes, right, I'm a socialist. We're all socialists here, we're striking, sanitation workers are striking, let's pull all our things together, and basically overnight becomes a union leader and also gains a reputation for being an especially hardline leftist. Well, yeah, that's the thing. 
uh, reading reading through the early stuff, there's a lot of leftiness. The, the Trotsky, the Marxism uh, in 1973, he apparently ordered his followers, because at that stage he had followers. Yep, he was a charismatic individual. Um, to physically attack meetings of the US Communist Party, uh, claiming that this would establish the hegemony... Is, hegemony or hegemony? I never know. One of those words oh, I've ever seen written down. I would go hegemony, but mm. then you're going... Hegemony, and I'm going, oh, I really don't know. At any rate, they would establish a hegemony of LaRouche's group over the US left, which is still very left, but then now he's attacking communists for being nuts, too left slash not left enough. Kind of moving from Trotskyism to Stalinism. But then, yeah, so then by 76, the, the various lefty organisations who were normally on the same side as him started to kind of notice that he was getting more and more conspiratorial. Um, and so you, you had the, the whole splintering, splitty, splitter thing. Uh, and so he ended up, ended up moving away from the left-wingers who were criticising him and, and becoming more and more and more right-wing. He did a Derek Hatton before Derek Hatton... Derek Hatton. Now, for those of you who don't know who Derek Hatton is, Isn't you'll me? be aware that... Earlier this week, there was a split of seven MPs from the Labour Party in uh, the UK right. to form the Independent Group, which is not a political party. It is at the moment a business organisation, which means they can take donations without having to declare electoral donations, which is pretty suspicious. And the day they left, Labour readmitted someone who hasn't been a member of the Labour Party since the 70s, Derek Hatton, who was a hardline left-wing mayor in one of the cities in the UK, ran the city into the ground, actually it was the 80s he was expelled, under Thatcherism, and then fled to a third country and started driving fast cars and glorying the fact that he had large amounts of money. Mm. So he went from being hard left to being very, very avant-garde right. And LaRouche was doing that before Derek mm. Hatton well, even go. had his hat on. He's the original. He was doing it before it was cool. Although we did mention time travel earlier, yes, so, so maybe, yeah, 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 who knows? Could who knows, even, who knows, quite who knows. frankly. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to... We, we talk about left-wing and right-wing, but really he was, he was definitely political, but his politics were just a little bit all over the place. He was, he, he was uh, something of a philosopher, which we, be both being philosophy graduates, um, know a thing or two about. But he like he was um, very, very much pro Plato, anti Aristotle. Which yes, in fact, he would refer to his enemies as neo Romans. Mm. Which um, there's a lot you can say about that. But short short thing is Plato. Uh, believed that um, there were ideal forms of everything, and including that, government, including government, and that everything in the world that we see um, has the attributes it has by partaking in some way of these ideal perfect forms. Aristotle believed there was no such thing as forms, and that abstract concepts like you know the concept of government and so on. Um, merely exist because things exist in the real world, and we sort of abstract these properties that they have in common off them. Which is very technical and philosophery, but um, it does kind of have some, can have some sort of real world implications when it comes to, yeah. You know, if, if you're a Platonist, you believe in the idea that there are the tangible ideals that can be striven for, whereas if you're an Aristotelian, you might be possibly more pragmatic, I suppose. I mean, Ar certainly... Aristotle is basically the or or origin of what we take virtue ethics to mm. be, which is you just inculcate the virtues in children to make them virtuous, as opposed to appeal to moral forms outside of the world that you can embody. So basically this means LaRouche was very, very, very sort of hardline. Well, the thing about LaRouche is that he's hard to classify on any standard left-right mm. divide because LaRouche's political views are more 18th or 19th century than they are anything else. Uh, so let, let me give you a quote from my PhD dissertation, Please do. where in the introduction I talk about LaRouche, and I say, former American presidential candidate Lyndon LaRouche believes the psych psychedelic rock group The Grateful Dead, we'll get onto them in just a minute, mm -hmm. were a front for the British Secret Service's occult branch and was sent to the United States of America by direct order of the Queen of England to promote drugs to American youths. 
According to LaRouche, this is simply one fight in the grandest and most philosophical conspiracy of all time, which is the conflict between the empiricists, whose philosophical leaders include such luminaries as David Hume and Bertrand Russell, and the rationalists, whose most notable founder, apparently, is Immanuel Kant. I put that in quotes there because standard notions of, rash, of rationalism don't include Kant, but LaRouche did. Uh, the empiricists, who according to LaRouche are the power behind the decadent United Kingdom and the European Union, are seeking to force their hedonistic ways on the American people and their American way of life, which LaRouche has identified as the most ideal form of rationalism. Mm. Uh, you notice you said, said at the start their former American presidential candidate. He, uh, ran, he ran for president times? eight times. Eight times. One of them from prison. Because yes, he also he, went to prison. For five years for mm. fraud. As you know, so he was sentenced to 15 years. He served five. Yep, in the 1980s he was convicted of conspiracy to commit mail fraud, 11 counts of actual mail fraud, and one count of conspiring to defraud the US Internal Revenue Service. It's interesting that fraud seems to be the only thing that um, rich white men go down for. Who was the pharmacy executive with the punchable face in the Wu-Tang Clan album? Oh, uh... Shkreli, Martin yeah, Shkreli. Yeah, Martin Shkreli. Yeah, he went to jail, not for hiking up the prices of, of drugs that normal people have. He went, he yeah, did Drugs for... which would normally cost mm. a dollar, which he then charged $500 No, but for. He, he went down for wire fraud or something as well. Yeah. It's only when you, when you start taking rich people's money that they give a shit. Anyway, enough communism. Um... He he was all over the place. Like we said, he he had he had a he had followers. He had a bunch of followers. Uh, at one point, a bunch of them were living in a compound with armed guards and crap like that. Um, he's said a great many things. A great many of them conspiratorial. And since this is a podcast about conspiracy theories, maybe we should be diving into the actual conspiracy theories that he had been known to promote. Well, let's talk about music then. Let's do that. He had very strong opinions on music. Very strong opinions. Right down to orchestras, mm. or at least orchestral... Classical music. Yeah, classical yeah. music had to be in a particular chord. Yes, they all had to be tuned in the pitch of A or something. I, I, that, those, those are musical words that I know. I don't know if what I just said makes sense. But he had very strong feelings about it and, and, and sort of lobbied official bodies saying that they should all be instructing their orchestras to be tuned in a certain way. Um, but he also but... believed that the Grateful Dead were sent from the UK to America to pervert the youth. And frankly, I would love to have seen the scene where Queen Elizabeth II ushers Jerry Garcia, mm. uh, who's presumably got short hair, it's probably a crew cut, mm. wearing a suit. Jerry, Jerry, my boy, I need you to go all the way to America. Then you're going to pervert the youth. Now, you have to grow out your hair, and you have to pretend to smoke a lot of reefer, and try some LSD. Now, uh, now Philip, Philip, come over here. Uh, give Jerry some of your LSD, Philip. Mm. Now, you have to try, you have to try the LSD, Jerry, so you, do, you know exactly what you I had, I had a tad just a few minutes ago, I had to say, it's barking in here, <laughs> absolutely Barking, Jerry. I mean, I can see dogs growing out of your groin. Uh, now, just take one of these tabs and experience what it's like. No, 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 uh, Philip, Philip, stop stroking his leg, Philip. Please stop stroking his leg. Uh, no, Jerry, now you want, no, oh. I feel no, this is Jerry. getting away from you a little <laughs> bit. It is, but you need to go to America. You need to pervert the mm. youth to bring America down. Now, we we did send the Beatles across for Beatlemania, uh, but it wasn't quite successful. Uh, so we need you to uh, just finish the process so that a young Donald Trump will one day become president. Oh, I've gotten political. Yes. Uh, but I mean, so not so. in terms of conspiracies, not only did he think that rock music, I think in general pretty much was a conspiracy, or at least yeah. part of the great yeah. sort of cultural war that, that was fueling these conspiracies, but also he believed that the British royal family were behind a hell of a lot of them, didn't he? Well, he was of the firm belief the British royals had never given up any power. So the whole ceding of power to the U.S. under George the Fourth, sorry, what was it? No, George the Third. One of them. Yeah, War of Independence. Uh, blah blah blah. Didn't it didn't actually didn't, happen. Right. Uh, it was all just a rose, and British interests were continuing to control the world around the place. He was particularly incensed by the notion of the European Union. Mm. 
uh, which is also under the control of the British, which would be really confusing to the EU negotiators under Brexit at the moment. Yes. Actually, not quite sure how LaRouche would have handled handled Brexit and died recently. Yeah, he died recently. Yeah, he was, must have been aware of it. But um, So, yeah, the, Brit the, the royal family uh, were behind the, the plans to send rock music to destroy whatever it was they were going to do. Uh, also thought the royal family controlled the world's drug trade. Well, you know, Jerry and the LSD. Mm, mm. And now the thing was, he takes it at the moment in time that the British royal family takes control of the world is once again for a really, really philosophical reason. Because he dates the birth of the British cartel to 1711, so the 18th century. And it's all linked to the insidious conspiracy theory by the Royal Society to deny Leibniz the invention of calculus. So, and I mean, this is actually one of those things which there's actually good evidence that something bad occurred here. So we get simultaneous development of calculus with Leibniz and Isaac Newton. And basically Leibniz submits papers to the Royal Society for his particular rendition of calculus. It uses a slightly different uh, diagrammatic form than the version that Newton preferred. And Newton did use his contacts in the Royal Society to delay the publication of Leibniz's paper so that Newton could get there first. That did actually occur. Newton was apparently not a very nice human being. No. But LaRouche takes this to be evidence that this is when the British cartel takes over the world. Right. As opposed to it being a thing that tended to happen a bit. I mean, we, 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 we sort of we name individual people, men generally, if we're talking a couple hundred years ago, as being the ones who ushered in this great sort of transformative revolutionary thing, be it calculus or whatever, when generally an idea is usually of its time and chances are a bunch of people are working on it at the same time. So, you know, all the people who were working on light bulbs before Edison stole their patents, all the people working on powered flight before the Wright brothers beat them to it. A whole bunch of people were working on a theory of evolution by natural selection. Darwin had to rush his book into press to get ahead of them and so on. So given that, it seems a bit odd to um, say this. this is one case of that, though. Isn't just competition in the academic world. It's the birth. It's the of birth a of the giant conspiracy. Uh, but he did say some wacky stuff. He said some horribly anti-Semitic and racist stuff. I believe he was a Holocaust denier at various points in his life. Yes, he was also a climate change denier and was of the firm belief that the US military was involved in 9/11. Mm. But of course, famously, he started the October Surprise theory. He did. Now we've. We've talked about at least one October surprise. I'm not sure if we've talked about this October surprise. Either. The original October surprise was during the 1972 election, where it was Nixon versus the guy who didn't get elected, because we don't, so we don't remember who he was, um, where Henry Kissinger put out a statement saying that peace is at hand, which, which was supposedly bolstered Nixon's chances of getting re-elected because he was kind of running on the idea that he was going to end the, end the Vietnam War. Uh, but in 1980... When you had Reagan versus Carter, wasn't it? I, I think it was Carter. Again, yeah, Reagan won, yeah. so, I don't know if, so nobody cares who the other guy was. Uh, but the 1980 presidential election happened, at the time that was happening, there was the Iran hostage crisis. Um, and, and the film Argo. Mm, that the film Argo is based upon. Um, so LaRouche, or if not LaRouche himself, then definitely his followers published claims that um, basically what happened was Reagan won the election, uh, the hostages remained held hostage in Iran until after he became president, and he, under his presidency, they eventually got released. The claim is that um, members of Reagan's campaign uh, conspired with the government of Iran to not make sure they didn't release the hostages until Delay, after the election. The hostage yeah. release. So that uh, Reagan could take full credit for their release, and supposedly they bargained as arms sales or something, you know, that uh, you you hold off on releasing those hostages to give Reagan a better chance of winning, and then once he becomes president, he'll authorise arms sales to Iran or something. I can't remember like that. Now, this was a view that was propounded by Lyndon LaRouche. It was also believed quite strongly by Christopher Hitchens. He, he died believing the October Surprise theory of 1980 was, in fact, the one true explanation of Reagan's win. 
And what's interesting about this is around about this time, Lyndon LaRouche is running an intelligence network of his own. So he basically uses his political connections in governments all around the world and in agencies in those governments like the CIA to create a kind of inte intelligence backbone where information can be traded behind the scenes. So the South African government was trading information with the US using LaRouche and his followers as a go-between. And for a few years, LaRouche is king of the hill until organizations like the CIA become aware of the kind of person they're in bed with, and then they start shucking contact with LaRouche. Mm. But at this time, and actually up until really until he died, LaRouche ran a bulletin called Executive Intelligence Review, or the E-R... E-I-R. That was going to fell me up quite dramatically, where this kind of information or compromise was being swapped so that people who are in the know could be even more in the know. Hmm. And possibly due to this uh, amassing of information, um, he did, at the very least, he did get one thing right, which was the Iran-Contra affair. Yes, which he talked about in EIR months before it came out in the rest of the mm. press. The Contra was selling arms to the Contras, was it? I, again, this is something that happened back in the 80s when I had no interest in politics whatsoever. So yeah, it was, it, it, but it, 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 was a, it was a large-scale mm. conspiracy yeah, being run time. by the American government. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is this the case of David Icke and Jimmy Savile, who, as we said before, may not have actually uh, ever published anything about Savile, um, but presumably dealt in the rumours since that always been going around and so claims that he was right on that so he was right on everything else. Was this was this a stopped clock being right? Yes. And the thing is, day, the or... thing about a stop clock being right once a day is it's still an unreliable clock. Yes, yes it is. And that's the problem with LaRouche. LaRouche may have on one or two occasions actually been spot on about a particular issue. But generally LaRouche traded in vapid conspiracy theories. I mean, uh, I don't know whether he actually made a list of all the weird things he wanted to do. He wanted to use nukes to create a brand new canal to take water into the center of Africa. He had some very, very bizarre views. Yes, I think as we've pretty much established, he was an interesting fellow. And in fact, what's really interesting is in the last few years, living off in his compound, LaRouche became aware that his message was not likely to live on if it was only in the hearts and minds of boomers who were his, his traditional Cohort. support base. Mm. So he formed a youth movement to try and get young people into the... The Giles of Lyndon LaRouche? Giles. That, that too. One of them. And so he told his boomer supporters that they should commit suicide. Mm. The world was no longer for them, it was for the youth, and basically the older members of LaRouche's movement should really consider wiping themselves off the map. Interesting. Now, one thing we didn't really talk about, of course, is, is we've mentioned that he has followers that they published this EIR thing and so on. But, I mean, they, they, uh, they were quite active. There are, there are, you can find lots of pictures online of these uh, LaRouche supporters, you know, picketing and protesting and holding placards up to, to, to publicise his various views and conspiracy theories and so on. They weren't, um, they weren't quiet in their opinions. No, they like were Mr. not. Much like Mr LaRouche himself. They were not. Mm. So there we have it, the life and times of Lyndon LaRouche. Interesting fellow, not so relevant in the last decade or so, which is why we've never really talked about him up until now, um, but we probably should have, to be honest. It's true, actually going through this has been quite fun. Mm, mm. Yeah, just just the, the, the sort of a character he was, and as we say, this was all before the internet. So, I mean, your, your Alex Joneses and your Jordan Petersons have leaned very hard on the internet to spread their message and get themselves heard all around the world, but Lyndon LaRouche did it the old-fashioned way. Yeah. And he did it in part because he was a charismatic individual. He did it in part because he had amazing organisational nous. And in part because he was something of a ruthless madman. He was. Mm. And sometimes that can be quite 
beguiling. Mm. So I think we've come to the end of the episode. We I have indeed. We've done a good survey of Lyndon LaRouche. May he rest in peace, or not, I guess, if you didn't like him, and many people did not. Now, if you stick around as a patron, in the forthcoming bonus episode we'll be recording in just a few seconds' time, we'll be talking about why Josh loves the Guilty Feminist podcast and why Deborah Francis White has a good point about 9-11. We'll be talking about the Chuck E. Cheese pizza conspiracy theory and also talking about the Vatican and its secret rules about the children of ordained priests. Mm. But if you want to hear about all that, you'll have to, of course, become one of our patrons, which we'd really like. We, um, what did we just do? We just bought licen a license for, for the sound, the sound editing, editing software, software we use. Yeah. Yep, yep, to, so, uh, patron. Things have patron th money. Mm. Pa patron money. 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 It's given us lights. It's given us sound editing it's software. It's given us life. Yes, but I we, we don't really need mm. to talk about the... The, the experiments, the, yeah, no. Yeah, no, precisely. No. It's uh, um, not worth mentioning. So what we're basically saying is thank you very much to our patrons, and if you'd like to become a patron, that would be just peachy. It would be. A mm. couple of dollars a month. Who knows what we actually are, you know, exactly what bonuses. You get bonus ep episodes and behind the scenes content. Mm, so there you go. Um, so for our regular listeners, uh, thank you as well for listening to us, quite frankly. Otherwise, we're just kind of two people sitting in a, in a sticky, humid Auckland summer room, uh, getting sweat misting up the inside of my glasses for nothing. So thank you, one and all. And I guess we'll see you next week. Love you, Debbie. Goodbye. <laughs>been listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy starring josh addison and dr m r x Denton, which is written researched recorded and produced by josh and m you can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its podbean or patreon campaigns and if you need to get in contact with either josh or m you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their twitter accounts monkey fluids and conspiracism It's just a step to the left.